everyone. Let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to today's University of Texas Energy Symposium for March 5th, 2024. I'm Carrie King, research scientist and assistant director here at the Energy Institute here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and before I introduce today's speaker uh, directly, you know, I will point out uh, the upcoming talks. So uh, next week, we do not have a talk for spring break, but the following week coming back, we have our own Michael Garrison is a professor in the School of Architecture to talk about uh, net zero uh, energy housing and affordable housing. And the week after that, we'll have Matthew Nemerson from Butterfly who works on energy efficiency in buildings. So kind of a similar topic, I suppose there, that'll be part of our uh, energy week, uh, which is the following week. So this is a free uh, event on campus, a series of, uh, discussions, student poster sessions, uh, and networking sessions. Uh, that is UT Energy Week. You can use that uh, QR code on the right to register. It's free to register. Come and go as you please, four days of events next week. Uh, but today, it is my pleasure to introduce Mark Lobby. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Engineer of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or otherwise known as NERC. Uh, brief Introduction of Mark here. I'm not going to read everything, but he is Senior Vice President, Chief Engineer of NERC. He joined NERC in January of 2007. He's held various positions, uh, including the Director of Standards and Vice President and Director of Reliability Assessments and Performance Analysis. What this means, if you want to know why the grid stays up or why it might go down, today is your day to ask someone a question who has been in the industry for a very long time. So please prepare all your questions online and here in the room. Uh, and uh, submit them at any time, and I'll look at them. Uh, 2012, he was elected to North America Energy Standards Board, appointed by the Department of Energy's Electric Advisory Committee as Secretary of Energy. In 2014, he served as chair and life member of the International Electricity Research Exchange and served as chair of a number of IEEE working groups. So IEEE is the uh, main professional organization for electrical engineers. He was named an IEEE Fellow in 2011, was awarded the IEEE Power and Energy Society's Roy Billington Power System Reliability Award, and in 2020, elected to the National Academy of Engineering because of his applications and development of techniques for electric grid reliability analysis. So prior to NERC, he worked at the Electric Power Research Institute for 20 years, and as well at the uh, what was then known as the Mid-Continent Area Power Pool uh, grid operator, if you will, in Minas Minneapolis, Minnesota. So it's had a long and storied career. This is Great chance to have an expert here who knows about electric grid reliability and the challenges that we are facing uh, coming up for the green uh, revolution. So his talk will discuss the challenges we face when we integrate more wind and solar uh, or inverter based resources. So with that said, I'm gonna pass it over now to Mark uh, and let's welcome here uh, to the University of Texas. Good afternoon. It's delighted to be here today, and uh, certainly a nice warm day. I was kind of surprised. I, I came in last night uh, to, uh, and I one of my colleagues that actually uh, lives in Austin. So we had dinner over at the uh, what do you call it, Lone, Lonesome Dove? They have rattlesnake on the menu and things like that. Wild stuff. But anyways, certainly a pleasant evening, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today to chat a little bit about uh, what we're kind of seeing in the grid and. Um, and, and to, to do that, I think it's important that we kind of find out how we got here and, and think about how we got here and what some sages and engineers of the past, what they came up with, why they came up with their the approach that we, we use today, and, and how we need to fundamentally change the way in which we plan and operate the system that's really transforming for our very eyes. And, you know, being a reliability engineer, you know, makes you kind of sound a little bit like a dirge sometimes. So please bear with me because I can chat a little bit about some of the challenges, uh, uh, realizing that there's there are substantial benefits to this transformation. But there are some things that we simply have to get right to make sure that we do it in a way, uh, as somebody has described to me, as, as a plane that's flying in the air and we're changing the engines on the plane. We have to keep it safe, affordable. Uh, uh, and, and, and ample, uh, certainly during times when we need it, uh, and and, uh, and yet 
make sure that the transformation occurs in an orderly fashion. So to think about from a historical perspective, and I, and I start thinking about the power system from my perspective, uh, because I was born in 1956. Uh, I do remember the 1965 blackout. Not that I was living it directly. Uh, it was in the 1960s. Of course, that's the time where we had songs like uh, California Dreamin' by the Mamas and Papas. I'm sure you all have heard that song. Uh, Wichita Lineman by Glenn Campbell. I kind of like that because it's kind of electric, but maybe it's telephonic. I'm not sure. But it was also a time in the country where we had a lot of change. A lot of change, certainly, uh, because of, uh, of you know, of the, the rights of citizens changing. Uh, we were also, you know, ducking under our desks uh, because of the, uh, of the uh, Cold War that we were facing at the time. But this is also the time that we had this rather large blackout in the Northeast. It actually emanated from a uh, relay misoperation by Niagara Falls uh, but, uh, and, and the Canadian part of the, uh, the system. Yes, we are interconnected a lot with Canada, uh, and there's huge benefits there as well. You can imagine the renewable energy, the, the wonderful hydro resources they have in that country. There are those who would like you not to build them, uh, but they actually are still building large dams in Canada. But anyway, so this blackout was a traumatic experience, a traumatic for the public because they didn't know what caused it initially. I mean, communications, I mean, it's not like a cell phone, right? I mean, IBM 360s were just maybe coming out at that point in time. So we didn't have huge computing power either. Uh, so what happened and, and how did we get there? And was it something related to the Red Menace or, you know, what, why we no longer have electric power? And it, 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 over time, and it took a, a year or so to kind of clear out the brush and figure out exactly what happened going through a sequence of events. And then there was, of course, a demand to do something. It was the Federal Power Agency, I think it was called. Uh, it came out with its Blue Ribbon Report. It was actually in coordination with the Canadians. You know, the Canadians don't like the federal government of the United States to tell them what to do. So it had to be kind of a collaborative working relationship. And uh, and and it, it was the decision was made at that time that we had this huge benefit of interconnecting. But in the 60s is when we really started interconnecting large amounts of the system together, everywhere from Ohio to New York City, down to the southeast. Uh, some of the transmission lines that we have today, which we're refurbishing, are from that era, from the 1960s. In fact, most power companies were run by electrical engineers or mechanical, not because it it was simply because they were construction companies. They were building stuff, a lot of stuff, as opposed to perhaps now where we have lawyers and, and some financial people that are running utilities. At that time, it was a major construction project. So we were interconnecting the system, and the benefits of the interconnection includes power pooling, which means that I can count on my neighbor for reserves. If my power plant goes down, I can count on them and vice versa. Voltage support and frequency. Frequency is the heartbeat uh, we have four heartbeats in, in this nation and well in North America, um, actually five because you got, you got you got Mexico, you got the West, you've got Texas all by itself, a couple of DC lines around it, it's like a big island. It's got its own heartbeat of 60 Hertz and then you got the eastern interconnection rolls all the way up to Quebec. Uh, and Quebec has its own kind of heartbeat, but they all are going at 60 times a second. but uh, that, that heartbeat is is there. So but there the, the benefits, are, are huge, but there's also risks. And the risks include things like something happening in Canada, blacking out New York. What is my neighbor doing? Are, are they doing the same thing I'm doing? If you look at the blackout of 2003, and we'll get there in a few minutes, uh, that was actually us returning the favor to Canada, which started in the Midwest, actually in Ohio, and emanated into New York. So anyway, as a result of this, this study, uh, there was two major organizations that were formed uh, to do collaborative research, which was the Electric Power Research Institute. You saw that on my resume. They're based in Palo Alto, though most of them are now in Charlotte and, and Knoxville. And it was collaborative research, industry working together, funding research to address reliability challenges. You got to understand, of course, what the, the state of relaying and control and how that changed over time and to where we are today. Uh, and uh, a lot of research was performed. 
on improving reliability of the bulk power system, generating plants, nuclear plants, uh, end use consumers uh, and demand response. All of that was done by EPRI. Uh, and, and all utilities had a join and they had a tax credit. And that's kind of changed over time. And then also then NERC, at that time called the National Electric Reliability Council, became North American and a few years later because of realization that Canada plays a major role here. Uh, and then, of course, on to becoming a corporation later. And this organization, the one I work with, really is focused on, uh, you know, making sure that we know what the rules of the road are. And at the time, it was mostly just peer pressure. You know, let's, you know, if, if you're not doing something to, based on the criteria that we all agreed we were going to follow, then by gosh, you know, they, they'd go to a meeting and, and get a tongue, to, uh, a tongue lashing and they'd go back and fix it. And see, the, in the United States, especially, it's very different in the way in which we created this electric power industry. Most countries you go to, they have kind of a central authority, electric, electricity de France, right? EDF, big monstrosity, all of France. Uh, you know, major corporations like the National Grid. It was at one time called the CGB in the UK. And of course, they kind of they kind of privatized all that. But most of the utilities, the electric utilities of the world were kind of centrally planned by government. In the United States, totally different pathway. We had the entrepreneurs, the Edisons, the Westinghouses, stringing up wires, creating companies, that was the investor owns. Uh, they got kind of a bad name sometimes because they overcharged and all that, or where they weren't willing to uh, or perhaps electrify rural areas because there's no money in it. You string 10 miles a line to get to one customer. But of course, then consumers need electricity. As you know, it's become just a, a natural way of, of living. And so, uh, so there were, we then, of course, had with federal agencies and, and cooperatives that were developed with federal government support with low interest to no interest loans to, uh, to electrify rural areas. Uh, there's municipals uh, that have sprung up federal agencies to control floods as well as generate electricity like Bonneville Power, Tennessee Valley Authority. And so we've had this kind of polyglot of utilities. Now, how are they all going to work together to make sure that what happens on one system stays on that system and doesn't impact the neighbor. So the criteria were being developed in the 1960s as well. Things like famously known as the next worst contingency or N minus one. Uh, there was also then this idea of a rule of based on probabilistic analysis of one event in 10 years. It was a capacity based rule, which basically you built your system to and uh, and uh, and based on forced outage rates and all that, it's a probabilistic analysis. And then you say, well, this is now how much reserve margin do I need to sustain that one in ten? Around fifteen percent for most thermal uh, systems, and about ten. Uh, this would be over your peak. So it was all based on peak and and full capacity. What's the nameplate on the unit? That's how much I can count on. So that's and that world is kind of a world that kind of progressed throughout the, the 70s and 80s. But if we look at the 1970s, yes, we're finally getting to the 70s. Uh, well, that was the band of gold. I remember that was the first 45 I bought. The second one was uh, Brandy. Um, my first album was uh, Deep Purple, Machine Head. Oh, it's a good song, it's good, good, good music there. Um, you know, by the way, with Sears Radio, you're always back in your era. I can listen to 1970s radio and think I'm in the 1970s or 80s. My daughters are so tired of it. They know all the songs from that time period. I'm starting to learn a little bit about Taylor Swift, though, so you know, just kind of handing it back. But anyway, so huge build out of central stations. The idea that, you know, large was good. You got a kind of a, a, a scale there. So large generating plants, large nuclear plants, large coal plants. Um, and it, in fact, some folks even said it's going to be too cheap to meter. It's an electricity is going to be so cheap. Well, of course, that wasn't true. And there certainly are some issues around on both of those plants and maintenance of those plants. And uh, there's always a concern about having to carry the, the largest. The, always the thought was one and a half times the largest plant was what you had to spin or have hot spin to back up the, can the case when the, that power plant failed. You know, and usually you'll have this random equipment failure and one plant might go down because a pulverizer is failing or boiler tube failures or whatever. And we'll get back to that because that's changing. 
Now, in the 1980s, were characterized by gas reform and the emergence of the gas bubble. There's a lot of gas out there. And um, there was also the combined cycle uh, gas turbine technology, which was much more... Uh, uh, much cheaper, especially when you had uh, the you know kind of a, a marginal cost for the long run, and uh, that of course really led into an explosion of gas plants in the 1980s. Some actually over explosion, too many plants. In the 1990s was this era of of restructuring, um, and the whole idea is to kind of drive out high high fixed costs in plants. You know, I, I think markets are really good at short term efficiencies, not so good for long term investment. Uh, for electric markets, but anyway, that that really changed the the uh, the uh, tenor of well, who owns reliability? It, it used to be uh, you know you'd go to uh, uh, what the Houston Light and Power uh, uh, and say to them, well, you know, you got soup to nuts. You're a vertically integrated utility. You got the generation, the transmission, distribution, and the customer. If there's a failure, you're the one at fault. You screwed up. But now if you have a company that owns transmission, another one owns distribution, another one is a merchant generator, and something happens, who, who's at fault? Who's, who, who's responsible? And so there was this conversation at that time in the 90s about, well, we better um, start figuring out what functions do what and assign them criteria that they have to follow. We used to call it criteria rather than standards. And so that started in earnest in the latter part of the 90s and then with the 2000 and 2000s, the 2003 blackout occurred. And I remember when that happened and I said, gee, have we not learned anything? It's the Northeast all over again. Um, but in this case, it was trees, tree trimming, right? Real blocking and tackling stuff. So that when uh, you have, uh, when, you're, when your line gets too close to the tree, it's called a minimum voltage. Uh, uh, you, can, you can create a, a flashover that takes out one line transfers power to other lines and they sag because of the heat and the amount of power they're carrying and they trip in the trees and so boom, boom, boom. And that's what that started that mess that ended up being the 2003 blackout. So government acted. And in 2005, they put together this Energy Power Act where they called for an electric reliability organization where the regime would be an organization that sets standards working with industry. And again, this is unique. Uh, and then make sure they comply with those standards and there are actually fines and enforcement on those, as well as then continually study the system looking for risks. We you know, gather data about the system, uh, transmission outages, generator outages, uh, and, and look for performance differences and, and put together assessments either looking forward or on an ongoing basis looking at the state of, of reliability of the grid. And so that NERC then formally actually applied to become that electric reliability organization. And we became that in 2007. And we have six partners uh, across the nation uh, and Canada. In Texas, it's called the Texas Reliability Entity. It's based here in Austin. Uh, and uh, of course, they work well, had and glove, obviously, with ERCOT. It's actually the ISO, the independent service operator here. And then we have five others across the, the nation that we work with who help us with this whole idea of, you know, compliance and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, also enforcement. And of course, what's unique about this is that industry writes the standards they're going to follow. Think of uh, most regulators, you know, like the EPA, uh, they will put out a rule based on some analysis they've done. They take industry comment and then they put out the final rule, and there's and then it's what that's what the rule is. And then there's many times right into the courts it goes and takes years to litigate until they finally get to the the end point of that rule. Uh, when NERC writes standards with its in industry uh, partners, they write it, they ballot it, two thirds majority, and then we submit it to our independent board. And the reason why we are a 501c6 is because, again, the Canadians don't like the, the federal government of the United States telling them what to do. Here they can come in and help write the standards and have them customized for each province because each province is a little bit different. They don't have interprovincial uh, AC connections. And so, uh, uh, and, and, and then once it's approved, the board approves it, we send it to FERC, the, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they litigate on it or tell us what they if they wanted to make any changes. They can't write standards themselves. Only industry can write standards. Uh, and then once they're approved, then, then implemented. 
So that's kind of a unique model. And so I, that's the 2000s. Um, and then, of course, in 2010s, so that's when the renewables kind of really picked up. I remember we put together some reports on variable energy resources, mostly focused on, on wind at the time. But then the solar panels, uh, you know, the price on solar panels really dropped. And uh, then, you know, of course, uh, they became much more affordable. And, uh, and because of that affordability uh, and the desire, I think, uh, by, by society to have greener energy, there was this view that we needed to kind of start thinking about, uh, uh, you know, substituting existing resources. So I think our decade, the decade we're in today, and we're four years into it, is really how do we assure resource adequacy? That is to say, the one in 10 I was talking about before, making sure that you have the megawatts you need them, you need when you need them uh, to meet uh, consumer needs at the same time that we have a substantial amount of electrification, made large data centers, electrification of automobiles and transportation overall, and who knows how many other uh, manufacturing and commercial practices. And at the same time, um, dealing with cybersecurity, which is really becoming more and more a concern, not just on the, the business side of the house, but also the operating technology side of the house. And, and we are also now building resources that are very uh, dependent on weather conditions. Uh, it was far less so when we had coal piles in the back 40 for three months. Um, and maybe we have to dynamite them if they froze up a little bit. But or if you had a if you were pulling dirt out of the ground, the lignite and burning it, um, now you have to worry about is it really cold out and how cold is it and how how cold can my plants take before they start coming off? Things start breaking on them, just like my car used to. And when I lived in Wisconsin, uh, you had you know you had to plug it in to keep it warm. I used to put charcoal briquettes underneath it. Good thing I didn't burn it up. Uh, but anyway, to heat up the engine and the oil. Uh, so you could keep it going. That kind of thinking now has to be uh, something we need to be looking at now, as well as we have become more energy constrained because fuel is just in time delivery, wind, solar, gas. And of course that gas issue is another challenge. And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later on. So I'm sure you're tired of looking at that one slide. So let's kind of drop into the next one. And we call this kind of the energy policy trilemma the idea that a resilient organization is going to be able to have access and affordability for electricity, be reliable and secure, and actually resilient is another key word here. Resilience means how quickly can you come back once you've actually had a failure? Because we can't build for everything. You know, every hurricane, you know you're going to have to come in behind it and restring wire. You just, it's just automatic because you, know, you can just build 150 miles an hour or so on and you're, you're back, you're, you're rebuilding. And then, of course, being environmentally, you know, sustainable. That's the kind of utility of the future that we need to be thinking about. So we have this, this kind of, I'll call it complex um, environment for risk. And, and, and this is, uh, I think, really much different uh, than we had before. And I think I, I actually kind of call it a lot of uncertainty, more uncertainty than we had before. Certainly this rapid changing resource mix that I talked about before and, and, and the interest that the public has in creating this green future. And I'm all on board for that. I think everybody is, we'd like to get there. We need to get there. Uh, but the question is well, at what speed and as we start replacing existing resources with new types of resources, what are their characteristics and there are some key engineering tech, uh, characteristics that we need to think about and think about how we replace when we, when we go from synchronous machines that were providing 60 hertz uh, and VARs, which is reactive power, support voltage, uh, and, and inertia, the oomph, to slow things down when you have faults and stay on during faults uh, on the system until you can clear it. Uh, that what, is, what are some of those challenges? I mentioned extreme weather complexities and, you know, this may, you know, <laughs> a windy day in Iowa used to just be a windy day in Iowa. 
But now a windy day in Iowa may mean that you're you're, you're uh, feathering 16,000 megawatts of wind. Feather means I can't take it. It's too fast. I got to turn my 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 wind aside because my uh, structurally I can't take that wind. And we had days like that where we're losing transmission line and generation at the same time. It's just in one case 16,000 megawatts. So it's not even during a peak day. I don't even know if it was extreme. But we're going to see more extremes for sure because climate change is upon us. And no matter how much carbon we take out of the air, there's a number of countries that are putting a lot more carbon in. So we're going to have to be dealing with this changing weather conditions around climate change for some time to come and, and, and making sure that we harden our system for that. Because at the same time, people are becoming more and more dependent on electricity. They're single threaded on electricity. Uh, I used to live in a small town called Yardley, Pennsylvania. It's on near the uh, the border with pencil uh, with New Jersey, and that's Nurk Nur used to be uh, in Princeton at one time. And uh, whenever it got cold and snowy, that's when the distribution would go off. We had a lot of people with trees in the area, and he had to wait for that condition to go away before he can get workers back out there because it wouldn't be safe. Uh, and so I remember my dad calling me, and, he's, and uh, I said to him, "You know, I'm taking the girls out for breakfast. We got to get out of outside of our neighborhood here. It's getting cold anyway." You get him a nice warm breakfast. And he says, well, you have a gas stove, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, but it's got an electric starter. He said, well, use a match. So that's kind of diversity of fuels, right? Now you won't have that diversity, right? So a, a bad day can become a really bad day. Uh, if your car isn't full of, of uh, gasoline, of course, it'd be a problem if you went to a pump uh, that was needed electricity. But if you're, if you're depending on electricity during cold weather, uh, your batteries don't have as much charge. Again, these are things that we need to be able to deal with and think about because the implications of electricity and being single threaded on one fuel and not having diversity is, is a real challenge and something we need to be really building in as we look forward and having more extreme weather and more dependence on, on electricity. Of course, the, you know, there's obviously a lot of growth in a load, as I was talking about it before, not only just the large data centers that you're seeing here in Texas, cryptocurrency uh, uh, centers, AI, artificial intelligence, which are basically number crunching, you know, data crunching to try to get to averages and, and uh, look for trends. These are all going to be substantial load centers, along with commercial and industrial loads. Uh, and uh, I talked to my friends who have electric cars, and they say they're basically using three times as much electricity than they did before to keep their car charged. And of course, they try to do that during certain hours of the day. They get certain rates to do that. But obviously, the load is going up. That's not only a local distribution challenge, but also just how do we make sure we have the energy we need when we need it? And then uh, I just call it the toxic soup of, 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 uh, of you know, cybersecurity, which just continues to be a real challenge for us. Um, and, and, you know, what we're actually what we're seeing, some of the biggest, the biggest challenges are just when we look forward and NERC gathers data on forecasts, that'd be forecasts for demand, forecasts for uh, generation growth. And we, we, we're just concerned about what we think is the unmanaged transformation, the, 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 you know, it's, it's everybody's clapping when we shut down the coal plant, but what are we replacing that coal plant with? And, and what, what, what is that? What are we lacking when we, we, we replace it? For example, if we have a hundred megawatt plant and we replace it with hundred megawatts of solar, most citizens say done, but no, we're not done. Um, there's other things, even if the sun is shining all day long and all night long, that the, the power plant gave you that the solar doesn't give you yet. Things like frequency, things like ramping. We call this essential reliability services. So what we kind of got away with murder in this industry when we would do our calculations of one event 10 because it was based on capacity. And with that capacity, we got energy, which is megawatt to hours, kilowatt hours, and essential reliability services. Riding through, uh, you know, faults, uh, uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, making sure there's frequency, inertia, slow down the events. So we need to replace that uh, with something. And right now, with the, most of the inverters that we're putting on the system are kind of following the frequency, 
given by generating plants. Well, now we have to start thinking about how we replace that frequency provision. And there are ways of doing that, but we have to make sure that that's all, again, part of the substitution. So it's not just 100 megawatts for 100 megawatts, but then also some of the other things that we need to keep that system reliably operating. And so that really takes us to a point of, of thinking about, well, you know, what, what should we be building to? What is the design basis of this system? It used to be one in 10, it used to be NERC standards. How do we need to change some of that? These are kind of hard to read and I apologize for that, but I think what I'm just trying to get to the point of that what we're at the same time that we're going through this transformation of resource mix, we are also now having higher load growth. And uh, that's, you know, for many years it was flat and pre-pandemic. Pre uh, I, had, I had friends in the industry with forecasting. And they said, well, tell me what the load was yesterday. That's what it's going to be tomorrow. They, they, in other words, there really was no challenge. It was very much a world of incre incrementalism. Um, and, and also we're seeing supply then, of course, getting, uh, getting uh, smaller. And of course, these are kind of averages. In other words, if you have 100 megawatt solar, during the day, you figure you can get about 100 megawatts unless there's cloud cover, then maybe you're getting 20. Uh, oh, but wind, you're kind of looking for kind of some long-term average, what total amount you're going to be able to get out of it. So these are not nameplate numbers, but uh, kind of like what uh, kind of average is based on past experience. So we're seeing a reduction in generation. And you know, I guess the formula that I always like to keep in the back of my head here is that is that um, capacity used to equal energy plus essential reliability services. Now we have to start looking at energy needs and essential reliability services needs, and then figure out then what the capacity requirements are going to be. So it's not going to be based on, on uh, you know, kind of nameplate uh, anymore. And we are starting to see a growing number of areas that are at risk in the country. Uh, to for resource deficits and risk does not mean reality. It means it's a higher level of risk. I talked about it before about uncertainty. Uh, we are building in a lot more uncertainty where we didn't have uncertainty before. Uh, uncertainty around fuel availability uh, at nighttime. How are we going to make up the difference? And and I, and I really I don't care about one day extreme weather events. I care I care about five days. These are kind of like tail events that we didn't have to worry about before because of the capacity challenge uh, issues we had. Uh, generally speaking, we could kind of overcome uh, certain weather events, especially if we had sufficient amount of transmission to bring in energy from places where it is to where it ain't. Uh, and, and, and now with the, that we're seeing higher risk, especially in the middle section of the country, uh, that's considered MISO, Midwest uh, Independent Service Operator. They're getting very tight on resources. Uh, of course, in the, the West and, and, and uh, Ontario, perhaps some more of a medium. Um, and, and, and this really kind of looks, this is really looking at the kind of retirements that we're seeing and, and the existing fleet, about 80,000 megawatts of retirements in the, in the coming years. Some of them are premature. Some of them are time for them to retire. Uh, uh, and then, of course, then the replacement then, generally, if you look at queues in and, and, and various markets, Almost all of them are really solar resources. And, and I think that it's really important to understand that the inverter is, is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, technology. It's been around a long time. It's been used for motor drives. It's been used now for inverter-based resources across the country. But what we are also seeing is that they don't always hold up when we need them to ride through. For example, in Texas, there was an event where we lost 1900 megawatts as a result of a line to ground fault. The vast majority of it was solar, it came off because it saw a fault and it said, I'm going away. Now, most generating plants are, in fact, the standards call for them to stay on for a period of time to ride through the effects of the short circuit and, and respond and provide frequency because if, after a certain while, you lose about a, a, a hertz, uh, 59 hertz, so you start dropping motors and elevators come off, stall engines and all that. So it's not a good good result. So you, you try to keep that, that uh, frequency pretty high. So inverters are a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, vice, especially now that we have a lot of storage we're building, solar, wind, 
but we have to make sure that we design them in a way that they give us what they we need from them. And this is a, a major change in the industry. Two changes now I've talked about. One is not just worried about capacity, but energy. So that's a big change for industry. It's not going to be one day in 10. It's got to be expected unserved energy. That's all probabilistic calculation. Care about, and we care about the scenarios and the, the tails. Uh, and, and then the other is I need to have three phase representations of my devices, not just a single phase. We used to get away with this uh, idea of just modeling one phase and, and studying the stability of the system with that one phase. Now we actually have to get into very detailed modeling. And not everybody knows how to do electromagnetic transients, especially bachelor degrees, but that's gonna to have to change to do model a system of the future. But there's a way forward. You know, I'm, I'm a dirge, I admit that. Um, but there is a way forward uh, to, uh, to make sure that we stay in front of this uh, transformation. And one, uh, we call them the kind of the four, four pillars of success. One is continuing to add the low and no carbon Resources, you know, in Texas, there's a lot of uh, ongoing research on carbon capture. Oxy is developing a plant. It's called direct air capture, which will just take air. Doesn't necessarily just be at the power plant. It can be automobile, any kind of carbon emissions, and uh, take it out of the air and then you know put it into the ground, uh, or, or perhaps you can also use it for other manufacturing processes. Um, so. Certainly there's some technology developments here. When will it be at scale? Will it be by 2030, 2035? I don't know. But I think right now we need something we can, you know, certainly dispatch so that when the wind isn't blowing, we have something to go to. On June 6th of last year, we had 60,000 megawatts of wind from Saskatchewan to Texas generating 300 megawatts. That could have been a bad day, but it wasn't because we had someplace else to go. Some of it was solar for sure, but also, you know, spinning units. The same thing happened in Germany in September. I happened to be there and it was so hot. Well, I can't believe September and it's hot uh, in Europe. So that's just, maybe that's the climate change, but again, 60,000 megawatts generating 2000 megawatts. So again, you have to have a place to go. And so that might be some of the, the low carbon, but also you need transmission. I know people love transmission. I know that you're the kind of people that get out of your car and take pictures of transmission lines. They're beautiful, right? Not everybody thinks that. Uh, and so there's actually a real challenge to build transmission, not only because Texas, in the way they feel here about their staying away from the federal government, and, and, and so they've kind of created this island. And that's good and bad. You know, you got challenges with it as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, you know, some successes with it. But... You know, uh, it, it, transmission enables you to get green energy from where it's ample to where it's not. And so, for example, unleashing the wind in the panhandle in, o in Oklahoma uh, that's right now kind of stuffed and can't get out and get it, getting that to other states. And in this country, especially in the United States, Canada is even worse. They don't want to build lines between provinces because they don't want the federal government to get involved at all. But in the United States, it's quite similar where the states is, says, look, I, my state citizens have to benefit from a line coming through. And they don't have this idea that, um, for example, a truck drives through the free, you know, the freeway system built in the 50s was just to be able to transport tanks from one part of the country to the other. That's, why, that's how Eisenhower sold it. But, you know, the idea that a truck goes through your state and doesn't stop and buy gas. So you say, well, then I didn't get any benefit for that. And they're using my roads. But then they maybe they'll go to Chicago, go to a distribution center, and then small trucks come back and bring stuff to your grocery store. So there's some benefit, but most states don't see it that way. They want to say, if, if you're coming through my state, you better show me benefit to my state. Who's paying for this and who's getting the benefits from this? And I think we all benefit from electricity. But again, it's a, it's a hard sell. But I think we need to be able to get to a point permitting and getting a lot more corridors of transmission so that we can move the energy around where it's from places where it's ample to where it's not. And, and this can help us with those tail events as well. For example, recently during the MLK cold weather spell, I guess it wasn't as cold in Texas as it was in Erie, but it was still pretty cold. And PJM, which is out of Ohio and that area, they shipped 12,000 megawatts of Southwest Power Pool, which is right north of here. Um, I had that map up there before. 
uh, and then and, and turn around, and that's Oklahoma, and 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 uh, all the way up to the Dakotas, and then and then as the coal front went the other way, they were able to ship power back the other way. So this is the kind of uh, kind of uh, need we have for transmission. Balancing uh, things go up and down a lot more. Heck, I've been talking to these guys in cryptocurrency, and they say, well, we follow the market price, so they have this large load that's following market price, and they got a market right next door. And you're doing something you don't like to do that on a power system. You know, it's a nonlinear system. You don't like you don't like to shake it up like that. Yeah, but you have to be able to balance that somehow, and and uh, balance the uncertainties of weather, certainly on the short term, and even on the long term. Uh, if you have a week of cold weather, how are you going to balance that system out? If in fact your wind turbines are turning, or it's too cold and they can't turn, or it's too much wind. By the way, you can get too much wind, uh, or the solar panels are covered with snow uh, for a period of time. How do you how do you back that up, and how do you balance that? And then finally, what I've been talking about all along here is an energy supply chain. Where am I going to get my energy from? Where and when? Uh, and, and is this you know, dual fueling stuff? Is it is it going to be the hydrogen plant of the future? The small modular nuclear reactor? None of these are really ready for scale yet. But ultimately, we hope it will be soon in the next five to 10 years. Um, again, I don't know what the magic bullet's going to be, um, but uh, it's going to need something to help us back up uh, the, uh, the wind and solar energy facilities when they're, they become unavailable. And of course, all at the same time that we have this growing loads and a higher expectation for reliability. Again, think about you know, it's, it's so. <laughs> We are so dependent on electricity. It's, it's been wonderful. Cell phones, the, com the computing power we have at our fingertips, and now artificial intelligence. Some of the some of the things we just put in our home and don't even think about. I used to we used to have one TV, and now I got like four. You know, every room, click it on, put it on, be entertained. We have so much, uh, so many applications for electricity. I I remember about one of those blackouts. That we had in this blackout, it's a, it's a distribution system issue that we could get in our car and we drove across state line into New Jersey and got a motel. Why? Because, well, well, you couldn't watch TV. The cell phones were dying. I mean, no entertainment at all. And it was getting dark. Uh, and so we said, heck, well, we're going to go to a hotel. We can charge everything up. And, and we, it, so it's become really part of the fabric of life. Uh, and that, of course, I know that that's also an issue that people, would like to focus on when it comes to equality uh, and, and, and accessibility and ensuring that uh, it's affordable. Um, you know, if you don't mind me going off a little bit of a tangent, I, I think we're going to need to have kind of a cooperative approach with, uh, with uh, energy equity like we did with uh, with the uh, you know rural electric associations. Uh, if you are a, 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 an owner of an apartment complex, there is not very much incentive for you to build an energy efficiency because people who are renting the apartments are responsible for the utilities. Why would you, why would you be more energy efficient? We have to make loans and grants, loan interest loans and grants available to folks, or even if you own a home or renting a home, uh, it, it, sometimes they just don't have that money to make the investment for the long term. We have to make that money available so that, uh, you know, I think that if we had high, higher levels of energy efficiency, even during cold weather in Texas, less people would be affected uh, if they just can build for the summer instead of the winter. So with that, you know, I took you 45 minutes uh, droning on for a bit. Uh, happy to take any kind of questions. Uh, I certainly left enough on the table there. Um, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you kind of a few of how we got here, how important electricity is, and, and the two things that we needed to change. We need to change. One is the design basis for our our generation, and second is how we model and simulate the system. So I didn't get into the dirty details on a lot of that, but happy to try. So any kind of questions, we're happy to take them. All right, let's just give a introductory round of applause here before questions. Okay. All right. Anyone in the room have a question? I'm going to raise your hand if you do. I'm going to start with one online here while you think of a question. Um, one online here is, uh, what concerns you about most about EV charging at scale? It's just throwing out examples. Lack of electrical grade stainless steel or uh, transformers or onshoring manufacturing. So anyway, well, I, how do we think about EVs? In that's a very good question. And, and, and 
there's a couple of things I'd like to go, a couple of ways I'd like to go at this. One is um, EV charging stations and, and vehicles themselves can either hurt you during an event or help you. And it's just a matter of design. It's not a matter of cost. So we have to make sure that we're working with the OEMs that they know that when there's an event on a system, how they can actually support the system by riding through rather than getting off, providing energy from storage facilities when you need them to help you ride through those serious events. So, you know, certainly that's uh, uh, on the forefront, especially we started looking at now, not just electric vehicle automobiles, but then you look at large trucks uh, that will take a substantial amount of charging at any given time. Uh, and you can imagine all your semis being electrified and, and how do you charge them quickly? What kind of uh, stress that's going to be on the grid? And and certainly there are there is this concern about, well, uh, if you in a dispersed way at homes, there has been a concern about the impact on the transformers, the pull top transformers, you see them, or even some of the pad mounts. And specifically, uh, you know, that they, they, of course, are heating them up a lot longer for longer periods of time. It used to be they would cool off at, at nighttime, not so much anymore. The loads are going up. They were set up for a certain kind of loading. So you got to go back and replace them. And that sounds easy enough, except right now we have a shortage of distribution transformers. Uh, there's a certain amount of steel, certain kinds of steel that you use for transformers, which, by the way, are also very important for electric cars. And they pay more. Than electric transformers so uh, utilities have had to start rebuilding their supply chains around a distribution level transformers so that they can uh, you know can come back behind uh, uh, the uh, uh, ev uh, connections in, in uh, residential neighborhoods and uh, and build a system to withstand some of the higher charging levels so that's certainly an issue but i think it's one that with utilities needs to try to stay in front of uh, you know, they get notified generally when somebody puts a car on their 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 uh, their uh, meter uh, because they usually kind of help them kind of put the plug in. Uh, they get special rates so it's charged at certain times of the day. For example, in California, they want to charge your car at two o'clock in the afternoon because that's when solar is the highest. They don't want you doing it in the evening when solar is the lowest and you're you know using other kinds of generation, which are perhaps more environmentally, you know, have more carbon in them. Um, and so, but so I, I I think two things. One is make sure you design them so it supports the grid during certain events, uh, and second of all, uh, making sure that uh, uh, that you've kind of built a system that can sustain it uh, with high high charging levels in certain you know certain areas of the country where let's say you know trucks are going to be coming in, you're going to be charging them up or swapping out batteries, whichever way they end up choosing going forward. Uh, and uh, and I I saw a. Uh, a huge mining truck at Caterpillar, and it was a 40 ton truck electrified uh, and took them, uh, you know, they, 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 try, they try to charge it with the, their solar panels and, and wind turbines. So it, it takes them about a day sometimes to charge it all the way out. But, you know, if you get up to 80 percent, that's generally where you want to go anyway. So the last 20 is always the hardest part of the way. So, uh, yeah, anyway, EVs. Yeah, that, that's a, certainly a major load center uh, for the country. I see a day where you plan your trip ahead of time, so you know where you're going to go. Uh, you you know you stop along the way. You know, swap your batteries out, or they charge you, and you keep going. Right now, it's still a little bit. Uh, if you get off the interstates, it gets a little dicey sometimes. In rural Alabama, or that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Question in the room. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, in reliability, I think an important thing is for transmit. I am someone who likes to get out and look at transmission, so. I'm a little bit biased, but I think a big part of reliability is transmission lines not physically failing and causing uh, wildfires, right? Not only does that, uh, you know, cause a huge catastrophe, but that does affect the reliability. Is that a compliance problem? Is it a regulatory problem? Why does this keep why does this keep happening? I guess and I'm, I'm referencing the fires in Texas. I oh, think sure. some information is and, and, that's and, what happened. You know, we're not the first there. I mean, this also is a problem in Australia. And especially, in, uh, and they have the same kind of climate as California. It's called a Mediterranean climate where it gets really dry for a long period of time, right? And then, then you have storms like we have now. And maybe every three to four years, they're able to refill their, their, uh, their reservoirs. Uh, so it was a problem also in Australia as well. Uh, and, and part of, let's look at it a couple of ways here. First of all, if a fire is approaching a line and it didn't start it, 
the, there's still this worry, of course, of damage to the structure. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna de-energize the line uh, so that you don't uh, create things, make things any even worse because you're gonna have so much carbon going on insulators, short circuit, and you know. So now, uh, but the, the the problem of now having transmission lines in this case, many of them, I don't. I'm thinking of California here, okay. I um, mean, I don't think the one in northern Texas was formed uh, was sparked by any transmission, as far as I know. Uh, the one that you're working on now it was a lot of old lines that had been maintained appropriately. They had some of their original parts from 1906, wearing the rings out and finally just dropping to the ground. So you know, clearly, what they started to do there in California and are getting smarter about it is when they see the conditions that uh, uh, for, for a fire, then they start, you know, operating differently. Uh, certainly if they see a spark, they get people there real fast. So they're able to watch that through uh, uh, through satellites and also local uh, local sensors. So they're looking for, because sparks can happen. A transformer will fail. You try to get in front of it so it doesn't. Um, but we can't necessarily run things to failure. But they had a lot of older facilities there that now they're spending a substantial amount of money on to upgrade as well as then get the brush out from underneath them, which I think they kind of let go for, for a long period of time. So I know it's an ongoing effort. Um, they have meetings every uh, month or two, uh, uh, just kind of making sure, checking notes and, and, uh, and, and, and seeing what they learned from the last one. Uh, but you know, clearly it's, uh, now as far as, as far as where's the NERC's role, the sec this, this, uh, EPAC 2005, it's got it's section 215 of that clearly says that NERC cannot be involved with safety. That is OSHA and EPA and some of the others. However, I'm not feckless here, you know, so we, we, we have been bring we brought together industry across the actually across the world to sit down to talk about what they're doing so they can learn from each other and and what is their fire protection plan look like and share those plans with each other in fact there was a recent uh, meeting and uh, at the NOAA headquarters because it's, it's uh, golden Col no it's the north boulder boulder colorado uh, north of denver uh, where we brought folks together in the west and we monitor and gather information about the events were the transmission lines involved with them? Uh, did they, you know, create the, the event, or were they taken out because of the event? So we continue to monitor and make information available um, because clearly it's going to be an important part of of uh, the green future. We have to have good transmission. Absolutely. Have you ever? There's a book written about this. I can't remember. It's at the time. I'll remember about what happened in California, specifically uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and how some of these lines had been built in 19 whatever and companies bought and sold and people lost track of where it was what. And you think everybody knows where all their assets are. They don't. Yeah. I've talked to some guy from AEP. He said they had some lines that still had barbed wire. They were using it back in the distribution and the Appalachians. Yeah. I think they're ahead of it now, but Yeah. Barb, yeah, barbed wire, bailing wire, and duct tape can, can do even more than we thought. Okay, um, a question from online again. So, a uh, question about quantifying uh, reliability, I guess, to a degree. So, the economic costs of electric outages are concentrated in large, long duration outages. How does addressing these types of events from a reliability perspective different from historical standards or addressing reliability from smaller and more localized outages? Presumably, you still want to think about small and localized outages so they don't become big and longer duration. And then there's another question I think related is, uh, what are you thinking about replacing this loss of load expectation, which is maybe a shorter duration outage kind of quantification? So what can yeah. you tell us about how you quantify these things? There's, 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 there's a lot packed There's, there's a lot there. There's we don't a lot there. So much time. What was the first question again? Uh, just, it, are we having difficulty or do we, if you focus on smaller duration outages, does this prevent us from thinking about longer duration outages that have more of an economic impact or yeah. do we have to think differently about both? So we have to have methods for I, short I think you have and to long. think differently about both. The, yeah. the, the, the problem with the way, with the, meth, the methods we used to use in the past, they used to actually mask out some of the long duration. The whole idea with a one in 10 was, it was a one event in 10 years and there were some basic assumptions. One was every day was independent of the other. That means you had a problem, the next day it's gone. 
the, the plants are some of the plants are back up and running again within a day, right? That was one major assumption. The other one was a copper sheet, which means there was no transmission worries. Uh, it's got you know no congestion, uh, and but but it, and the third is it's based on random failures of large plants. Random failures of large plants, one probability stacked on top of the other. So 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 if your force out rate is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 times 0 0.15. So, you know, very small probabilities. Okay, now how we come to the day when it's cold from Minneapolis to Houston, common mode, common environment, everything affected at the same time. Forced outage rates skyrocket. Basically, it's a common condition, and you lose a lot of megawatts all at one time. It's not random. It's not run random. It's, it's really the probability of that weather event happening. So that affects the way in which you start looking at the world. And, and you have to look at short-term. See, the, when, you, when you think of, uh, of this call, keeps going at the value of lost load, it's, it's a hockey stick. People don't care until they do. And in other words, if, if it's an hour, well, it's an aggravation, right? Five hours, hey, wait a second, my my food's starting to spoil. It's starting to get cold in the house, maybe. Uh, and then, you know, 20 hours, life-threatening, you know, catastrophic. So the longer, the duration, the higher cost, not just in dollars, but in life and quality of life. Uh, so it skyrockets. So uh, we need to start thinking about those differently than we did in the past because we have this chance of having weather conditions that last a long period of time, not just one event in 10, you know, or you have random failures of single plants and the probability is very small. We're having cold weather events every year. It's just a matter of how, what the conditions are around it. When that jet stream comes from up north, on average, our winter was warmer, right? I was in a meeting and said, on average, the winter is going to be warmer. I said, yeah, but it's kind of like a, like a one foot on average hole with a 12 foot drop in it. On average, it's one foot, but you got you know we have one or two cold days. So uh, so now, how does that how does that change the way in which we think about building our system? One in ten is not sufficient anymore. We need to be thinking about expected unserved energy, and we also need to be thinking about scenarios so we don't we don't miss the tail events, the the, the severe cold, which may be one in ten or one in a hundred. Well, we're having a lot of one in a hundred events lately. I never really kind of figured it out because the country hasn't been here since what 1607, but somehow we have this uh, data of one in a hundred. I think it's some sort of statistical myth, but in any event, uh, we are having a lot of these events and we are, are having to learn how we operate the system during those events. So the work actually uh, the national Academy of engineering and NERC are going to have a meeting at the end of this month where we're going to be talking to the folks around the world on how they build their resources you know, because Australia is facing this issue, the Europeans are facing this issue, we're facing this issue. What should the design basis be? And it'll be probably one in 10 plus a number of other metrics. Question in the room here. Hello. So as someone who has been working towards uh, clean energy and with all the challenges with the grid and just environmental issues overall, how do you keep the hope? Like, how do you deal with the frustrations of when you see like changes not happening at the rate that it should for the environment? I, I, I think when it comes to the change itself, it is happening. It's coming at us like a freight train. So I'm, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about it happening as far as enough renewable energy being built to support society. What I'm concerned about is making sure we do it right. I always kind of look to two buckets here. One is engineering. Make sure that we interconnect things correctly. We can model and simulate them because that's how we do things in engineering. Uh, so we know that we've designed it right and it's going to work right. And right now we got to work on that because we have line to ground faults and we're losing 2,000 megawatts of solar just like that. And that can't, can't have that. Line to ground faults happen all the time. So, and that's a, that's a OEM engineering I was spending last night with my friend here talking about how we could fix that problem, and we can. Then there's the uncertainty. That's the other bucket. When wind isn't blowing, sun isn't shining, how do we back that up? What are we going to back it up with? Some people say hydrogen. Some people say, uh, uh, you know, maybe 
uh, air capture or, or, or carbon capture and sequestration. I, I think we're going to have basically a whole new energy system interconnected where we can get fuels that perhaps are liquid fuels like hydrogen or helium or whatever we, uh, is going to be the, the dispatchable fuel of the future, working hand in hand with electric systems. Uh, now, this is going to be probably a 2035 type thing, um, but don't be frustrated. Keep working on it. It's happening. And uh, uh, utilities I talk to, if they haven't seen it yet, I tell them, you're going to see it. You better get ready for it and, and make sure that you do it right. You engineer it right and you deal with the uncertainty. So uh, stay, stay, please don't get too frustrated. Stay on target. All right. Uh, all right. We'll get close to time. I didn't ask a couple of questions that could go for days here, but you can touch on them how you like. So one is interconnectivity and the other one will be interdependence, if you will. So uh, interconnectivity, even there's a, a proposed bill now of connecting ERCOT more to the rest of the grids. Uh, and so the question here would be more if, if, if we thought about connecting the ERCOT grid more with the other interconnects, is this really a, a DC volt uh, transmission line problem or is it an AC transmission problem or do we not know? Could, could either one work? Is one look more favorable than another? So that's kind of one question. And the other one is just, you know, how well are we doing on natural gas and electric yeah. grid uh, uh, well, interdependence? Good, so. <laughs> very good, two very good topics. In fact, NERC was ordered by Congress, who called it the Memorial Day Surprise, where they said, you will go out and do a transfer capability study. And, uh, and the whole idea was is to find out what is the prudent level of transmission capability so we can move energy from where it is to where it ain't. So we take advantage of the resources, uh, the wind resources and the solar resources and move it around. And so we're actually uh, uh, look, doing that study, and that includes Texas. Uh, we're not going to tell folks what the solution is because that, that's the third rail. Um, I, 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 there are pla there's a place for DC and there's a place for AC. Um, it, if you have point to point, especially if you want to bring energy from, you know, the, the Dakotas that are wind rich, you know, but of course they might have the same weather pattern. So maybe you want to go west or east. I know there was a lot of energy going east sometimes. Then you, you're going point to point, especially DC is great in long distances. You can, there are people that play with multi-terminal DC, but there's not a lot of it around. There's some of it, but not a lot of it. Well, AC is, or you can, is much easier to move from, uh, you know, multiple points and have multi-terminals and multi-transformers and move things along uh, a little bit at a higher voltage. Um, but there's there's the political piece and the, um, but I, I can tell you this, my view, Texas needs more energy capability during events. You're localized, you're a state, events can come here and sit. And you you don't have enough places to go to over a period of time when things start going going south. So where are they going to get that? If it's AC, DC, I don't know. But I think, it, you know, if it's, it's as, a, as if it's an island, as, as if it's Hawaii, right? And so you usually have to build more to be able to withstand that. But the problem here is, is that when the, if you build more and all the same weather conditions are experienced by this, let's say if there's no wind, if you built a thousand more wind plants, it wouldn't make any difference. You got no wind. And so, you know, that's that's what transmission gets you. This gets you outside the the the, the problem area to areas that have energy so you can bring it in. Yeah. Now, gas and electric. I think I, I, I was talking about before about this interconnected system, this interconnected electric system uh, and how what happens on one impacts the other. And so therefore, we have to have rules. The same thing now has happened between the gas and electric system. They have become interconnected, not just interdependent, but interconnected. What happens on the gas pipeline impacts the, the generation capability. If we don't provide electricity, processing plants, compressor stations, winterization doesn't work on the gas industry. So clearly they need to start working together. It's hard because they evolve totally separately. The, the regimes are different. We say, for example, you can't have a market in electricity unless you're reliable. First and foremost, you have to follow the reliability rules. They don't have that same regime in a gas elect in a gas system where they kind of put reliability and gas commercially together, and they don't have that kind of same set of rules. And so it's it's going to be a challenge to work, but we are working together uh, with uh, the natural gas industry, and I think things are getting better. Uh, but right now, we need to work on that interconnected system and what are the rules of the road? 
we, we call it a, a gas reliability organization, a GRO, very much like an electric reliability organization. And in fact, there's an organization called NASB, the North American Standards Electricity Board. They're based in Houston, Texas, and they came out with a report basically kind of calling for that kind of organization. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, thank you, uh, Mark Lobby, Senior Vice President, Chief Engineer of NERC. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you.